All right. So thank you guys all for coming. Um, I'll get going because it's 5.30 and I'm, I'm hoping uh, to leave some time at the end to um, have some discussion about this because I know um, it's a topic that I bring up a lot and I'm hoping to hear some other people's opinions outside of mine. Um, so just uh, housekeeping as always, um, I'm always looking for speakers, always looking for other ideas. So if anyone's interested in participating, please let me know. Um, I'm planning on the schedule for next year already. So um, anything after March, um, let me know. Um, we are doing a CME credit. There should be a QR code that I sent out um, in the welcome email um, and should be in the chat as well, the link. So we're trying to keep attendance. Um, it's a work in progress, but hopefully there'll be QR codes from now on. Um, if you're coming on, please mute, just uh, keep it simple. Um, and uh, that, unless you have a question, please speak up. Uh, always interrupt because it's going to be hard for me to watch the chat during this. Um, since I, I guess I never have introduced myself, if, if you don't know me, I'm Justin Knittel. I'm Section Chief for Trauma and Anesthesia. Um, today, I was going to talk about uh, a topic I really like to discuss, and that's um, the role of albumin and other colloids in the resuscitation of trauma patients. Um, now, I, I absolutely have no disclosures for this. Anyone that works with me and has heard me talk about albumin before knows I will never be paid by a colloid manufacturer. Um, so nothing to disclose for this. Um, the only other thing to say right up front, um, we aren't gonna be talking about burns. Um, and you know, burn and fluid resuscitation and colloid resuscitation is so specialized and really not something I want to get into for this. It's fascinating. Maybe there is something we can learn from it, um, but it's not something we're going to discuss directly today. Um, I know we have probably some burn surgeons on the call, um, and I'm very interested in having a talk on that. So if anyone wants to give it, um, we can definitely talk about burn resuscitation and colloids for that at some point in the future. Um, so the objectives I have for this talk um, are really to start to better understand the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of what colloids do. Um, talk a lot about the role of the endothelial glycocalyx and the starling forces of fluid movement and better understand those. Um, and, and really to discuss how colloids may fit into um, the acute resuscitation of trauma patients. Um, and hopefully, um, I'm hoping we have some people from outside of WashU on um, and we can talk about our practice here at WashU. We can hopefully hear about how other people may practice when it comes to colloids and resuscitation as well. So right up front, I think just it's important to remember the fluid compartments and what we're dealing with when we talk about fluids and resuscitation. Um, in terms of total body water volume, we're talking about 40 liters of fluid, about 60% of our weight. This is divided up into basically four uh, or three different compartments. The intracellular, which uh, is the majority, um, that's about 25 liters, and then the extracellular space, which is divide up in the interstitial and the plasma volume. And normally when we're talking about resuscitation, what we're really looking at is um, affecting the plasma volume. And I think it's also important to differentiate a little bit between fluid therapy and volume therapy. So when I think of fluid therapy, the best uh, explanation I think I've heard is, is fluid, when you're thinking about someone who needs fluid therapy, they're dehydrated. Um, so all of their compartments are down. And when we want to treat someone for dehydration, what we're really looking for is something that spreads out among all compartments. This is where something like crystalloids are really gonna come into play. And we do this with all of our patients. We all lose fluid on a regular basis, um, whether it's from breathing, insensible losses, things like that. Um, and we do need to replace that. So this is where um, treating someone for fluid therapy really comes up. Now, this is definitely different from volume therapy. And, and when we say volume therapy, that's more looking at intravascular losses. And especially in trauma, what we normally are looking at is affecting this volume. And, and why do we want to do this? Um, and, and part of this is we really want to restore the blood volume to normal. Um, we're thinking that if we do this, we're going to maintain tissue and organ perfusion um, and really um, maintain or increase the, the stroke volume. 
And the problem um, I have with this, and I think we, we discuss a lot with this, is that our patients are not losing crystalloid or colloids. Um, and this is what we are often giving for, um, to, to replace this um, volume. Um, our patients are losing blood. And so we just need to keep in mind that um, non-blood product resuscitation and what that's going to accomplish. Um, and really that's just maintaining the stroke volume. So there can definitely be downsides to non-blood fluids. And, and these are gonna be things like diluting uh, coagulation factors, other substrates in the, in the plasma. Um, and it's really getting in the way uh, of the, uh, to accomplish the normal jobs of the circulating volume. So transporting oxygen, transporting metabolites, um, as well as helping with things like clotting. Um, and again, we're just diluting this out by giving something that the body is not exactly using. So wh why give colloids? Um, and I think the, the most, most people, when they think about giving colloids, um, they're thinking about using it for volume expansion. Um, it's really not a good choice for um, dehydration. And, and the common perception that I hear is that albumin and colloids um, provide a lot more bang for your buck when it comes to volume expansion um, compared to crystalloids. Um, and I've, I've heard different ranges of what the equivalent doses of a colloid is to a crystalloid. You know, the common ratio that I was taught in medical school was that the typical colloid to crystalloid ratio was somewhere around one to three or one to four. Um, and this makes sense to me. I was used to com uh, comparing uh, a bottle of albumin, 5% albumin to bags or liters of crystalloid. It's easy to say that 250 cc's of 5% albumin is about equivalent to a, a one liter bag of normal saline or LR. Um, I've also heard where those initial numbers came from. Um, one of my favorites is that it came from a 1960s era um, OBGYN paper in a now defunct journal um, on a graph that had nothing to do with uh, volume expansion, and, but that's what people remember it from. Um, there are some studies that, looked at, that are more recent that actually did look at this, and this is one from 2001. Um, that was comparing normal saline resuscitation with 5% albumin in cardiac surgery patients. Um, and was looking primarily at how volume resuscitation related to tissue edema and oxygen delivery. And so if you look at the graph on the left, um, they showed that the extracellular fluid volume increase from normal saline was pretty much equally divided between the plasma volume and the interstitium. Um, and, and this is basically what we're typically taught about how crystalloids are going to act. They're going to equally divide among all the body compartments relatively quickly. Um, and that the amount that's really going to stay intravascular where we're looking for it to have an effect is actually pretty small and short lived. Um, on the other hand, um, the albumin administration almost completely affected the plasma volume. And their conclusion from this paper was that albumin was roughly five times better than saline at expanding the plasma volume. Um, and it actually had roughly the same effects on the interstitial volume. Um, if you look on the graph on the right, they, they looked at cardiac index in giving these, these uh, fluids. And what they found was that albumin was found to significantly increase the cardiac index uh, versus normal saline. Um, but there was absolutely no difference in the uh, delivery of oxygen. Um, and it was found to cause as much hemodilution as normal saline. Um, again, I, I don't really find this too much of a surprise when it comes to oxygen delivery because neither one of these fluids actually has the ability to carry oxygen. Um, but I also think it, it shows that maybe the increased stroke volume or increased cardiac index um, isn't necessarily end all be all uh, when we look at giving fluids like this. So one thing we probably have to define right away is what is a colloid? What are, what are these things that we're talking about? Um, and you know, the, the actual definition is it's a mixture of substances that remain evenly distributed throughout another substance. They're not chemically combined. Um, they also will not settle out. And these exist, um, we're used to see, seeing these in our refrigerator. These are things like butter, milk, and mayonnaise. Um, when we're talking about things, uh, colloids for medicine, um, we can divide them up into natural and synthetic. And our natural colloids um, are, you know, albumin is probably the most common thing we think of, but we should remember that Oh boy, um, let me get back. I don't know what just happened. There we go. Um, whole blood and plasma are also um, natural colloids. Um, 
Now, there are also synthetic colloids um, that, that have come up in medicine. These are things like starches, dextrans, and gelatins. And we'll talk a little bit more about all these um, in a moment. So we'll start with albumin. Um, I think this is the most common thing we think of. Again, it's a natural um, colloid. It is the most abundant protein in the body. Um, it's, you know, getting technical, it's a 66.5 kilodalton protein. Um, it has a hydrophobic center and hydrophilic ligands. Um, it has multiple functions um, in physiology. So it's responsible for about 80% of the oncotic pressures that we see in the plasma. Um, its levels are constantly in flux. It's, it's being shifted from the plasma to the interstitial space and then out through the lymphatics back into the plasma. Um, and it's cycled through uh, fairly rapidly, about, uh, I believe it's like 10% a day, um, very common and, and goes through very quickly. Um, interestingly, um, at any one point, more albumin is going to be bound to proteoglycans in the interstitium than is actually found in, intravascularly. So most of our albumin is not intravascular. Um, it does serve as one of the most important antioxidants in the plasma. Um, it's extremely valuable in terms of binding metal species like copper and iron, um, and actually helps in preventing the formation of hy hydroxyl radicals. Um, albumin also has the ability to bind nitric oxide, and it helps with preventing platelet aggregation um, in the nitric oxide's effect on that. So it can be thought to possess um, anticoagulant and antithrombotic properties. Um, and, it's, and it's thought that albumin can play a role in capillary membrane permeability, um, as well as with overall protein flux. And this is something we'll definitely talk about more. So moving on to synthetic colloids, just so you know what they are, um, I definitely do not see these very often, and maybe some other people, maybe some other institutions do uh, more. I know they're much more commonly used in other parts of the world. Um, hydroxyl ethyl starch, um, typically derived from potato or corn, um, and it can be very variable in terms of its molecular weight, especially compared to albumin. It's much bigger on average. Um, you know, things that are important about it is that it is renally cleared. Um, dextran is, is um, varying lengths of polysaccharides, um, again, with differing um, variable molecular weights. Um, and I, I've seen these used before, but it's been a long, long time. Um, gelatins are uh, derived from bovine collagen. Um, I Last I heard, they were banned in the 1970s from America. Um, they're not used in North America, but they are used in other parts of the world. Um, you know, part of the reason we don't see a lot of these used is because they definitely have a bad rap for side effects. And the two that stand out are renal failure and coagulopathy. And so it's, it's been a long time since I've seen these used clinically, um, especially here at WashU. So because of that, you know, when we talk about colloids and when, you know, for this talk, I'll, I'll bring up some of the synthetic uh, colloids later in some studies, but really what I'm looking at is albumin. And that's the one we tend to use like water here. Um, and so it's been used extensively in medicine for a long time. Um, first use as an IV fluid was back in the 1830s in Scotland. Um, it first became crystalloid in the 1930s and um, started being used as a blood substitute in the 1940s. Um, it is extensively studied in burn resuscitation and became widely used in the 1940s and 50s. And then in the 1990s, um, people started to look at, could we make albumin heme moieties and, and start using it as a possible like artificial blood and, and something that could carry O2. Now the 90s was not overall very kind to albumin. Um, and in 1995, there was actually an editorial in the British Medical Journal and it's where I actually got the title for this talk. Um, and the author, a guy named Neil Sony questioned the utility of albumin in administration. And basically that there was very little evidence about um, that supported its perceived benefits. Um, and what he was in fact referencing was the use of albumin compared to synthetic colloid alternatives. Um, but what his questioning led to was a Cochrane review that came out in 1998. And this review really kind of changed how albumin was viewed at the time. Um, they found, you know, you know, I'm sure most of us have seen Cochrane reviews before. They went through a bunch of different studies. They actually went through 32 studies. Unfortunately, the average number of patients in these studies was in the low 40s. Um, and what they found with the studies that they picked 
um, was that the pooled relative risk of using albumin in terms of mortality was quite high. And they concluded this by saying that there's no evidence that albumin um, reduces, uh, critically, uh, reduces mortality in critically ill patients. Um, and really it should not be used at all. And it's, it's interesting because uh, the author of the original editorial, Neil Sony, was asked to review this and recommended that it not be published because um, since the, you know, it, it's really come out that it was not a very thorough review. And, you know, I, I would say it definitely put a black mark on albumin and its use. Um, what the Cochrane Review recommended was that if albumin was going to be used, it needed to be used in randomized control trials. And that led to really what was my first experience in, in literature about albumin. That was a safe trial back in 2004. Um, so this was a randomized control trial done in Australia, had over 7,000 patients. And it was really a comparison between normal saline and 4% albumin. And what they found was that there was no difference in um, mortality after 28 days, no difference in ICU length of stay, mechanical ventilation, renal replacement therapy. Basically, these were equivalent therapies. Um, when they did a post hoc analysis um, and looked specifically at patients with TBI, um, they did find that there was a significant increase in mortality in patients that received albumin for resuscitation. And, you know, this is the part of the SAFE trial outside of these two, uh, outside of there being no benefit to albumin. This is the part that I always remembered um, was that, you know, basically albumin should not be used in head injury. And the SAFE, uh, the people that did the SAFE trial, um, went back and looked again um, at these patients. So again, for those keeping score, this is a subgroup analysis of a subgroup analysis from that original trial. Um, and what they were really looking for is a way to explain the, the mechanism for why there was increased mortality in the albumin group. And what they found is that uh, patients that received albumin did have a trend towards an increased ICP in the first week after head injury. Um, and this led to increased treatment for um, elevated ICP. Um, but that's all they could really find. Um, they, they found no difference in the coagulation profiles. And what they surmised is that the increase in ICP was due to either the passage of albumin through a disrupted blood-brain barrier um, or because of the hypotonicity of the 4% albumin solution compared to normal saline. Now, this, I mean, this is an old trial. This is from 2004, initially, when all, the, all these patients were studied. Um, I, you know, I've always kind of viewed this as pretty much a done deal. We don't use albumin in head injury. And I was actually reading a book on perioperative fluid management recently, read the albumin chapter, and was surprised that this was now being challenged a bit. And, you know, really what people were focusing on is it's not the albumin that's bad, it's the hypotonicity. And um, people were going back and saying, well, maybe we need to, maybe it's okay to use albumin in these patients. Um, and I don't know if anyone's familiar with something called the Lund concept of, of TBI, um, but that's, you know, looking at where these, these challenges were coming from, um, it, it seemed to relate to this concept. And just to go off track a little bit, the Lund concept of TBI is this a volume targeted approach that focuses really on transcapillary hydrostatic and osmotic pressures. Um, it was, I looked at these studies that said, you know, albumin safe and, and head injury, and they all seem to be coming from Sweden. And Lund is a city in Sweden. Um, all of this seemed to be from small centers in Sweden. It's the only place in the world where this concept has, has shown a benefit. Um, anytime it's repeated anywhere else, it, it really doesn't pan out. But it, it said that people are questioning this theory and they're, they're looking at this capillary hydrostatic and osmotic pressures. So that kind of leads us into the next part of this and that's looking about capillary membrane forces a little bit. And so this is the initial model um, that Starling put out uh, over a hundred years ago. Um, about capillary membrane forces and essentially saying that there is a balance between hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressures and that this determines the fluid movement between the intravascular and interstitial space. 
And the thought was that the fluid moved into the interstitium on the arterial side of the capillaries um, due to the higher hydrostatic pressure on that side. And fluid would be reabsorbed on the venous end of the capillary as the hydrostatic pressure dropped. Now, Starling immediately recognized that this may not be the most accurate of models. And, and part of it was it's only a two compartment model where he, he admitted right up front that humans have an intracellular compartment um, as well as a lymphatic system that cycles the fluid back into the plasma um, outside of these, these mechanisms. And he, he was right, even though they couldn't measure all the forces at the time, um, when it became possible to measure all the forces in the classic equation, it became clear that the model breaks down. And the reason it broke down is it was found that the interstitial osmotic pressure was much higher and the interstitial hydrostatic pressure was much lower. So that the capillary filtration pressure, the, the um, pressure that was actually pushing um, fluid into the interstitium was always going to be higher than the opposition pressure, meaning that across the entire entirety of the capillary, there was going to be filtration and never absorption. So this led to the re revision of the Starling model, as you can see on the screen. Um, and basically things were moving in one direction with no absorption, proteins, fluids, everything just moved from the vasculature into the interstitium and then the lymphatics would cycle it back out. So the question is, how is this all regulated? And that brings us to a, a topic that's come up a lot more recently in trauma and in critical care. Um, and that's something called the endothelial glycocalyx. And what this is, is a um, mucopolysaccharide mesh system that separates the plasma from the endothelial wall and really regulates the interactions between the vessel wall and the substances in the plasma. Um, it's really thought to be integral in maintaining fluid homeostasis and regulation of the vascular permeability. Um, but it's also involved with a lot of systemic effects. Um, it's involved with the release of inflammatory mediators. Um, and there are even proteins that can sense changes in hydrostatic pressure and shear stress can release different um, activators such as nitric oxide. Um, so it's, it's a quite active part of um, the, the body and, and I think something that we've definitely underappreciated. So we'll talk about structure a little bit more. So I mentioned that in the classic Starling equation, um, it looked at the balance of hydrostatic and osmotic pressures between the intravascular and interstitial spaces. And that fell apart because once these pressures were determined, um, the flow just didn't add up. Um, and, and what was found is that the concentration of proteins in the interstitial space was far too high um, for flow filtration to actually flow interstitially. Um, and also when they actually made changes to the osmotic pressures in, in the interstitium, um, they saw no changes to the filtration. Um, so there had to be some other part of the structure that people were missing. And what the discrepancy was solved by was factoring in what's called a protein uh, or what is a protein free space just under the endothelial uh, glycocalyx and that's the sub endothelial glycocalyx. Um, and this is a space that's maintained protein free by a constant uh, outward filtration of fluid. Um, again, since there's no absorption back in, it can stay free of protein. Um, and it's as well as uh, due to the plasma protein filtering effect of an intact like, uh, endothelial glycocalyx. So there are basically two parts to this before you hit the vascular wall. Um, filtrate flows therefore through the sub uh, glycocalyx space, um, out through um, intercellular clefts um, and through very tight junctions here. And it's this high, these very tight junctions and a high flow through them that prevents movement back. Um, and so it maintains this space as being protein free. So if the endothelial glycocalyx is damaged, then the sub endothelial glycocalyx um, is also damaged and is now not protein free. And the flow of fluid is determined more by the protein concentration of the interstitium. Oops, sorry, let me go back. Um, so it's when, when the flow is determined by the protein concentration instead, because there's a higher amount of protein in the interstitium, this increases the flow of fluid into the interstitium um, since the osmotic pressure is much higher. Uh, it can also lead to proteins flowing uh, freely into the interstitium uh, directly as well as the fluid. And this will also end up pulling more fluid along with it. And, and part of this is the reasoning behind why colloids 
um, have not shown as much of a benefit um, in, in studies versus crystalloids, such as in the SAFE trial. Um, these studies are all done in, in patients who are clinically very sick and likely have damaged endothelial glycocalyxes. And this is probably why, you know, compared to the paper I showed at the beginning saying that, you know, albumin has five times the effect on the, vas uh, on the intravascular volume as crystalloid, well, that doesn't really pan out in, in other trials like the SAVE trial. So we know that in trauma, the glycocalyx is broken down and, and shedding occurs. Um, and what can trigger this are mediators like TNF-alpha, uh, reactive oxygen species, um, things like heparinase and inflammation. Um, it can also be triggered by adrenal activation, um, hypoperfusion, hyperglycemia, and um, even hypervolemia. Um, so trauma itself causes the release of proteases from neutrophils and tissue, um, and it leads to the cleavage of the proteoglycans that make up the endothelial glycocalyx. This disrupts the glycocalyx, more easily allows for the adhesion of leukocytes and platelets. Um, and this is actually a positive feedback loop. So as things adhese to the endothelium, this causes more of a release of inflammatory mediators um, and actually causes a progression of this whole process. And the thing is, these effects are not only seen locally at the site of injury, um, but can cause changes systemically as well. Um, and this may account for some of the other effects that we see in trauma um, across other organ systems and not just the systems that are um, directly affected. And so there are, studies have started to look at, are there ways to assess the integrity of the endothelial glycocalyx? And um, this is a study from 2017 um, by Rodriguez and et al, who looked at one of the most common markers for endothelial glycocalyx breakdown, that's syndicant one in the blood. Um, what they did is they measured syndicant one in the blood and defined um, a point where uh, they felt like they could call uh, was what they termed endotheliopathy of trauma. Um, and at that level, um, and that syndicant one level, they saw a greater uh, number of mortalities at 30, 30 days, as well as a need for uh, more blood products. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about syndicant one later on as well. So let's take a step back and we're gonna go back into time a little bit, back to the 1970s. And we're gonna look at some papers um, and a series of studies that actually came out of Wayne State um, looking at colloid resuscitation and hemorrhagic shock. And I know we had a couple of our fellows um, from Wayne State uh, last year in surgery. Um, I know Ilya, Ilya Rakitan actually sent me this paper um, or a series of papers and um, hope maybe he's even on. If he's on, I hope he says hi. Um, but, you know, it's something that we had talked about last year what, during his fellowship. And so at Wayne State in the 1970s and, and early 80s, they had done a series of studies on patients in hemorrhagic shock, um, both blunt and penetrating trauma and injuries, um, and, and looked at different ways of resuscitation. And so right off front, um, they identified a couple uh, phases to resuscitation. Phase one was the roughly seven hours from arrival to the end of the damage control operation or the point where hemostasis was essentially achieved. And again, about seven hours to, to get to this point. Um, phase two was a, a period of time where fluid was sequestered into the extravascular space, typically the uh, interstitial space. And this lasted up to typically on average around 29, 30 hours. And then there was a phase three where um, the interstitial space and all that fluid would contract back in and fluid would shift back into the um, intravascular. And this would last up to six days. Now, there's definitely some issues with going back, you know, 40 years to look at um, papers um, and, and studies and trauma. Things were done a lot differently. Um, so you can look at these tables and, you know, immediately see how heavy on um, packed red blood cell transfusions they were, um, how, how much crystalloid these patients got, um, especially compared to how little plasma they got. Um, so, you know, I can't say that this is necessarily the standard of care um, that we would practice now, but I think it's a good point to look at uh, 
I think they did a very good job looking at colloids and, and different aspects of colloid resuscitation in trauma patients. And so that's what we're really going to talk about. And, and so, you know, they, they did some animal studies to go with it. And this is actually some um, data from the animal studies looking at protein flux and hemorrhagic shock. Um, what they found, um, and I think this was a canine model, is they found when, uh, um, when shock was initiated and during the period of shock, so this is basically um, the phase one, phase two uh, part of, of their series, um, all proteins would drop um, in terms of concentration. Um, and they, they were able to look at the, the ratios of um, filtration through the lymph system and would compare the ratio, the lymph to plasma ratio of proteins like albumin um, and actually found that these, these ratios were increased in the shock period. Um, and it's thought that this is due to the contraction of the interstitial space and that there's an increased efflux of proteins into the lymph, lymph system. Now, the reason it's not circulated back into the plasma is that the lymph flow was overall drastically reduced during this part. Um, and then as the patients were resuscitated, um, the lymph flow was restored, but the protein levels never returned to this uh, normal or to their baseline. And what the authors surmised from this is that the proteins have to go somewhere. And this really indicated that the proteins were being sequestered into the interstitial space. So we'll come back to some of these things, but going back to their um, human studies in this series, um, this was a series of 96 patients um, where part of a subset that they had looked at and they had, were looking at albumin versus normal saline in terms of the resuscitation. Um, and what they found, um, as, as these tables show, is that less fluid was needed um, in the albumin group, the patients that resuscitated with albumin. But, and, and this is in the initial, the phase one pay, uh, uh, part of it where um, they were achieving uh, hemostasis and um, operating on the patient. Um, but what they found afterwards in their phase two and phase three is that um, these phases were much longer. Um, so phase two was, was much longer and increased in terms of how much fluid was sequestered extravascularly. Um, and this is thought to be due to the expansion of the interstitial space um, as it opens up, it opens up more space for albumin to bind. Um, what they also surmised from all this was that the body maintains an oncotic ratio. So um, you can see from the table that, you know, as you gave the, the patients that received albumin actually had a decrease in other proteins, such as globulins in the blood. And so um, this oncotic ratio is maintained very tightly by the body during resuscitation. Um, so increased oncotic pressures in plasma with the albumin supplementation also caused changes in other systems, such as the renal system. And even though that they found that there was increased renal blood flow, increased plasma flow, um, there was decreased uh, GFR and decreased uh, renal function. Um, and so, you know, al albumin um, resuscitation seemed to have a lot more effect than, than just on volume. Um, it, it did, like I said, uh, impact other globulins in the blood, specifically immunoglobulins. Um, the authors looked at whether that had any impact um, on immune function. They actually found that these patients had decreased immune response to a tetanus toxoid. So they concluded a few things from all this in terms of what albumin does. So good things that it does, it definitely increases the plasma volume. Um, it does increase your renal perfusion. Um, but it also had a lot of other effects. It decreased your GFR, it decreased your um, urine output, it, it increased your need for diuretics. Um, it actually affected your, your uh, respiratory function. And these patients had longer time spent on the ventilator. They had decreased uh, PO2 to FiO2 ratios. Um, it, they saw a bigger systemic response and things outside of just volume expansion. Um, and, they looked at some other aspects, including coagulation as well. Um, and part of this was they noticed in some of these initial studies that there was an increase in blood products needed um, to achieve hemostasis in the albumin group. And so when they looked at uh, different uh, concentrations of coagulation factors, they found that these are decreased in albumin patients. So uh, specifically when we looked at um, 
different coagulation factors, they found a decrease in fibrinogen uh, function. Um, they compared it to not just albumin, but they did uh, studies with Hespan as well, found that this was even more pronounced. So basically administration of colloids caused problems across the board in coagulation. Um, so in fact, it, all serum proteins that were looked at decreased with albumin administration, um, decreased with Hespan administration, so another uh, synthetic colloid. Um, and patients that supplemented were, with albumin actually required more blood transfusions, like I said. Um, what's interesting is when we looked at Hespan specifically, so a synthetic colloid, um, albumin concentrations decreased significantly with administration. And so again, the authors went back to this thought that the body maintains an oncotic ratio. And so if you add any colloid, anything that messes with this oncotic ratio, this is going to change the, the flux of proteins uh, systemically. And specifically what it's gonna probably do is, is increase the flux of proteins into the interstitial space um, to help maintain that ratio. And I think this is kind of a really important concept because I, you know, when I started looking at this, that was not something I was, I was expecting or really heard about before looking at these studies. Um, and so I, I think it's something that we don't really consider a lot of, but these studies really show how big of an effect giving one protein can do to other proteins. Um, but that's, you know, again, looking at all the things that albumin can do, can um, albumin have any other effects? And one of them, one of the questions that came up is, can it affect cardiac function? Well, albumin is a binder of calcium. And so a study in 1981 um, looked at calcium levels in patients that received albumin and found that they had lower ionized calcium levels compared to those patients that were not given albumin. Um, and these patients were also found uh, to have decreased left ventricular stroke work index. So it basically showed that albumin can have a negative inotrope effect. Again, something you know that when you think about and, and um, talk about in a trauma patient, these are, these are things that are definitely not helping our cause, especially when most of our patients are already hypocalcemic. Um, and that's only gonna get worse as we resuscitate them. So let's take it back to more of a modern day view and, and talk about, um, what uh, colloids can do to the endothelial glycocalyx. So this was a paper from 2007. Um, and what um, Jacob et al. did is measure the filtration in guinea pig hearts uh, when per, uh, perfused with either albumin or heta starch. Um, and then would add a heparinase, which would disrupt the endothelial glycocalyx. And so if you look on the graph on the left, um, the addition of heparinase um, and the presumed disruption of the endothelial glycocalyx structure led to an increase in the extravasation of both albumin and heta starch uh, when compared to the standard conditions. Um, when you look at the right, um, it shows that the concentration of both albumin and heta starch in the transudate, um, so basically what was being filtered out through the lymph system, quickly began to approach um, the coronary effluent or the fluid that was returning to the heart. Um, again, showing that the protein concentration in the interstitial space was approaching that of plasma or that we were seeing the flow of uh, uh, protein into that interstitial space. And again, this is one of those studies that shows why um, in, in a damaged endothelial glycocalyx um, may be the reason why we're not seeing as much bang for our buck from um, uh, colloids in, in a lot of the studies. So, you know, at, at this point, it, I, I really had a hard time justifying, you know, ever, ever giving colloid. Um, and I didn't want to give a one study view. So I wanted to find some benefits to giving colloids and, and looking at them in, in shock models. So um, there are studies out there that, that show a benefit. This was from 2002. Um, it compared albumin and normal saline um, and resuscitation of a rat model. Um, now, I will just point out importantly that uh, this group used uh, hyper-oncotic uh, concentrated albumin in their study. Um, and overall, the albumin uh, group received half the volume as a saline group, no differences in the mean arterial pressures. Um, they found an increase in abdominal blood flow um, and in, that, in the albumin group as well. Um, they also found 
that um, the velocity and shear rate, which are markers for um, evaluation of the microcirculation, were both higher in the um, albumin group, so showing a benefit to microcirculation flow. Um, and then they also found that there was decreased uh, rolling at adherent leukocytes in the albumin group. So maybe going to the fact that albumin causes um, a decreased inflammatory response. Um, there's some studies that show benefit in synthetic colloids as well. So this is a study from 2011 um, looking at um, head of starch versus normal saline. Um, and they found that the lactating clearance improved um, in penetrating traumas when uh, patients were resuscitated with, with head of starch versus saline. This is another uh, paper from 2006 um, in a rat model showing that um, Patients that received albumin actually had decreased inflammatory markers, um, maybe uh, a lower lung injury uh, severity score as well. Um, so something that maybe albumin can be, uh, or colloids can be a positive thing. Um, this was a similar experience in, uh, experiment in 2020, again, looking at hemorrhagic shock model in a rat. Um, they used, instead of albumin, they used hydroxyl starch. Um, and in terms of their inflammatory markers, uh, you know, the group used Simican 1, what we had talked about before as a marker for endothelial glycocalyx disruption. Um, and they found no difference uh, between the groups. So synthetic colloids may really not show the same inflammatory benefit um, as um, albumin. This was a recent review from Germany um, looking at head of starch and trauma. Um, they had examined about 50,000 trauma patients who had received head of starch uh, or had been resuscitated for trauma between 2002 and 2015. Um, and they found an association between receiving more than one liter of head of starch and renal failure, as well as the need for renal replacement therapy. Um, and any uh, patients who received head of starch at any concentration um, had a risk, increased risk for multi-organ failure um, when, when compared to resuscitation for crystalloid. Their conclusion after all this was that um, synthetic colloids specifically may be harmful and the guidelines that recommended crystalloids for trauma resuscitation should be followed. So I'm gonna switch a little to another colloid and just talk about plasma. Um, and it's because we've, we've definitely seen some studies recently, um, both the prompt and proper trials that showed that early use of plasma um, definitely was a benefit in trauma resuscitation. Um, and, and this was an interesting paper um, from 2016, looking at a rat model of hemorrhagic shock. And again, going back to um, focusing on the endothelial glycocalyx and what the effects may be with different fluids for resuscitation. And when you looked at this um, and looked at the different fluids, it was rather extensive how many different fluids they used. But basically across the board, um, plasma, whole blood, and, and pack cells all showed a, a great benefit in terms of maintaining um, your syndicate one levels at baseline, meaning that you're not seeing as much breakdown. Um, you're seeing much less changes in permeability. Um, they showed uh, versus another uh, marker of, of glycocalyx breakdown, uh, heparin sulfate, um, that this was much uh, lower in um, plasma uh, patients that are the rat model that received plasma, um, as well as the thickness of the uh, glycocalyx overall. This was maintained the best with plasma. This is another study from the same group um, looking at the effects of resuscitation fluids on the glycocalyx as well as coagulation. Um, these racks that received FFP um, showed normalization of their syndicate one levels um, in the post resuscitation period. Um, and the same with the thickness of um, the glycocalyx. And all of this data, these data points really indicate the ability of plasma to possibly preserve the glycocalyx during resuscitation. So the military um, has addressed this, has, has gone through quite a, a cycle. Um, and I know we have some military people here that may want to comment on this. Um, but when you look at what they've done when it comes to resuscitation, you know, before the 1960s, whole blood was the way to go. Component therapy came around in the 1960s. Um, 
synthetic colloids showed up in, in the 1990s and were deemed to be as effective and, and as safe as, as crystalloids. Um, this changed a good amount over time and with experience in the battlefield. And, you know, in the early 2000s, um, early blood transfusion really replaced um, the use of crystalloids and colloids. And now, you know, as of 2014, it was really moved to whole blood and, and really only uh, colloids when nothing else was available. And it, it brought me to this really good quote, um, you know, from um, Lieutenant Colonel Andre Cap, who wrote this paper um, about uh, the use of blood in 2015. Um, and, and I think it, I mean, it really sums up my view on the whole thing. Um, but you know, I think it's I, th I think it's important that that we realize that trauma patients may be different, and we need to think about them a little differently. And what we've been doing for years and years is looking for a different way to get around what we know is the actual problem, and that is that these patients are losing blood. And so every time we look for the band aid of giving crystalloid or colloid solutions, um, we're we're missing the fact that this is not what we know they need. And you know, I always look at this going well maybe that really should change how we practice and what we are doing. And we need to focus on that rather than putting band-aids on things. So, you know, I, I know a lot of you who work with me know that this is my practice, but I really don't use 5% albumin if I ever can. My, you know, reasons that we didn't really talk about is um, it is hyperchloremic. I hate high chloride levels. I think normal saline is poison. I think 5% albumin is poison. Um, it does have the negative ionotropic effects. I really don't want that in a trauma patient. Um, I think it's pretty clear that it has a uh, effect on plasma proteins. I think there's definitely something to the studies of Wayne State and looking at the protein flux. And if you give a colloid, you're going to mess with other proteins in the body. And this includes the coagulation factors. Um, I think there may be a very tiny benefit towards um, volume overall, you know, crystalloid versus crystalloid resuscitation, um, but it's small. And I think the reason because of, because we see that is because of the endothelial glycocalyx and our, our lack of understanding completely of how that really matters. And it's much more expensive. You know, a bottle of albumin costs about $36. The last time I checked here, a bag of normal saline or LR is about a dollar. Um, so your bang for your buck, you're not getting a whole lot. And I think there are a lot of other problems. Um, if, if I really think the volume matters, I'm going to use concentrated albumin, um, and I'm going to mix it with LR basically. And I think this uh, balances out the hyperchloremia. Um, I'm not going to leave that alone without giving a lot of calcium as well. And more importantly is I'm much, much more aggressive with blood products and have gotten very aggressive with plasma. Um, I don't use synthetic colloids at all, um, mainly because I don't see them. Um, now, all of this, this is my practice now, I will say I'm completely open to change. And I think there's a lot of directions this can all go. Um, you know, I don't see a role for colloids right now in trauma resuscitation outside of plasma and blood, but that may change. Um, I think there's, I think we may have a role for colloids if we use them in an appropriate way. And, they, and it may not be for volume, it may be as a medication. Maybe if we use them as an anti-inflammatory medication, you know, it will show a, a benefit. Um, maybe if we're using hyper-oncotic formulations, um, maybe if there are better synthetic formulations, um, we will show more of a benefit and maybe they should have a role. I just don't see it right now. Um, I think as we understand the endothelial glycocalyx a lot more, we're going to understand a lot more about how fluid works and we may come up with better strategies. Um, I think big picture, um, you know, again, talking about band-aids and where I think we can go, I, I think we may need to spend more of our time looking at transfusion triggers and trauma and being really the experts in transfusion. Um, this, I, I think, you know, transfusion at earlier points, not following the guidelines or the triggers that we're used to seeing in other areas, because these patients are doing something different. Trauma is its own disease process. And I think we need to recognize that. Um, I know I'm running long, so I want to kind of cut this off and conclude here and basically open this up to discussions and see what other people think about all this. So with that, Let's chat.
or not. I'm just waiting. Well, I'll open up then. Um, I always love talks that confirm my biases, right? Um, exactly. Yes. Unfortunately, I, I try to be open here. Unfortunately, it's not a bias if the evidence supports you, right? Then it's facts. Right. And so I, I there was some other stuff you didn't talk about, but what what we're basic what you're basically pointing out that is albumin can't be a resuscitative fluid if it's sitting in the interstitium, right? I mean, and, and if it's in brain tissue, it's even worse. I mean, that's, so I, what you're getting at is that if it's not in there, why isn't it in there? Damage endothelium, damage matrix, leaky gap junctions, damage blood brain barrier. I think they're all the right thing, but the problem is once it gets out there, it's even harder to pull back in for all your other arguments and it has to get out through the lymphatics and otherwise. So. I put in your chat a long time ago. I'm not sure who makes makes albumin or has this much money to support it. Any other drug that completely failed this many different trials would not still be on market. Yet people keep on trying to find a new way to use it. And I'm still completely, I can't figure out why something that costs 20 times as much, many people want to keep finding a better solution for when we haven't found it. But that's my thoughts on it. I can't disagree at all. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with all that. I, I, don't, I don't know why we use it as much as we do. Um, I, I try to be open-minded with this and say, maybe there's some evidence out there I'm missing. Um, you know, especially when it came to, you know, this whole thought about maybe we, we, are, we need to reconsider it in TBI until I saw who was writing all that. And it's like, wait, these are the same people that have been saying since the beginning that this isn't the way to do it. And they can't show that it's a benefit. And everything I found only made the situation worse. And it's like, this, this, there's even more problems than I thought. There's even more, there's less reason to give it. It's not that it's equivalent. It's not that, you know, I look at the safe trial and say that things are equal. I think it's actually, it, it does more damage than we think, at least when we use it as a volume expander. And, you know, that, that to me does not seem like the way that this should be used. And, you know, even a couple of weeks ago, I saw it being used in a Belmont again. And it just kind of kills me that that's going on. So, but I, I know it's also used at Wash U like water. And, you know, I, I'll put Justin Richards on the spot just because he's the one that's popping up and he's at a different institution. And I'm kind of curious what other people do. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. No, good. I, I was uh, waiting for to hear Doug's comments first. <laughs> um, I agree with, with everything you you said, because I think that that's spot on. This is, it's been an interesting topic for me and I'll explain for a few reasons why. Um, but I think especially with, with trauma, I mean, the, the data supports, just like you said, this this is a Band-Aid. Why do we keep looking for Band-Aids? Um, and, and there are much better options out there. I think the, with regard to traumatic brain injury, the, the, when I was a resident, the thing that always got me was, okay, if we shouldn't be given albumin and TBI, maybe we shouldn't be given plasma. Uh, and interestingly, the PAMPER trial, when that came out, their subgroup of TBI patients who got plasma and got it early, they had a better outcome too, um, which I think was just more evidence that, yeah, the plasma is the better option early. Um, I think the, especially in acute trauma, the role for albumin, I, I don't see it at all, just like you, you nicely described. I think it can come with so many more problems. Um, I think the, the questions that I run into, especially in the intensive care unit, and this is where I'd be curious to get your opinion, is you've got those patients who um, either they're needing to be resuscitated with volume, not necessarily anemia, they're not actively bleeding, they're not in hemorrhagic shock. Um, they probably have some type of endothelial dysfunction. They may be vasodilated. Um, and yet they keep getting crystal, liter of liter and liter of crystalloid. Uh, and those are the folks I just, I don't know what to do with. Because um, I think the excess crystalloid is bad. The albumin can probably be bad. We think vasopressors are bad. I might have some different feelings about that. Um, and even albumin as a resuscitation fluid, um, 
that's where I, I don't know, uh, because we start looking at more granular data with, with folks who don't have massive risk, massive transfusion who are getting plasma, small volumes of plasma, but the uh, the potential organ failure effects, at least that's been shown retrospectively. So that's where I get really confused in terms of once you get out of that acute resuscitation period. Well, and this is, you know, I, I said at the beginning, I'm not talking about burn, but it is something where I wonder if there's there's going to be something we're going to learn from it. Um, because, you know, it, there is that whole, burn ran into the same issue and, and burn resuscitation. People were getting flooded with crystalloid and everyone moved away from albumin and then we're going right back to albumin. And, you know, albumin is being used as this rescue formula. And, you know, I know Doug and I have talked about with some cases, especially when we're seeing like five liters of crystalloid being given in bowel surgery and going, could we try something else? And, and, and I do wonder if there's going to be something that kind of breaks this up um, or if we're just down the wrong path completely and there's gonna be something else that we have to focus on. And, and again, these are all band-aids. The, these were, were basically improving our stroke volume and that's it. And you know whether we need to work on ways to stop the, uh, venodilation and and actually collapse the system a bit, um, better ways to maintain perfusion or better ways to look for perfusion to say, we're actually better off at lower pressures, we're, we're okay at these points. Um, you know, ways to counteract the inflammatory response. You know, I think those are, those are where we have opportunities to find a solution because yeah, we're, we're, you know, I look at a lot of this and it's, it's like a payday loan where it will get better for 30 minutes and then you're just gonna pay for it for days and days and days. And I've always said that's not, never is it worth it to do that. We need to come up with a better solution in, initially. Yeah, and I think even the, the military's data going back a long time uh, with the value of plasma in, in burn um, and not necessarily just albumin. The other part I throw in, because I think it's so important when we read studies, talk about it, um, it, just the role of hypoalbuminemia. So we say you look at an albumin level on emission. Shoot, I, we're collecting some data on this that we haven't published yet, but I think it's really interesting of the albumin, serum albumin as a marker for either severity of illness, risk of organ failure, risk of mortality, risk of kidney injury. Um, but I always say when we discuss that, this doesn't mean that replacing albumin with an albumin solution is gonna be the answer. In fact, I think you have to be very careful in interpreting data that way. Well, but, yeah. the problem, I gotta say, the problem there is that if you look at almost any of these studies, no one really does study hypoalbuminemia, right? They're studying resuscitation. Uh, there is not, not that, to my point, a very good study looking at trying to replace someone's albumin in a critical illness. There's some replacing albumin in cirrhotics when you're doing taps and all that. And there's actually some evidence that when you're doing that, you can help by adding some pressure and, 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 and decrease the volume given. But Again, I think the difference between a replacement fluid and a resuscitation fluid are markedly different. And as Justin has said, in such patients, I'm not sure if you're an albumin fan, why you would, would even come close to poisoning it with normal saline. Why not just give it 25%? So I think people try and extrapolate a replacement to a resuscitation. And I, in, if someone has an albumin in one and you're resuscitating them and, and it's really hard to resuscitate them, can I tell you not to give albumin? No, because there's been no study with people that be, with albumin that low. And maybe a, a bolus of 25% is something you do um, because we don't know better. Uh, but I, I don't think it's true if you've driven it down that way, but if they, if they sit there. So we don't have that on that. So if you want to try it, I can't be against it. Oh, no, you know, yeah. I think the idea that we have to replace albumin because somebody comes in with a low albumin level is is way extrapolating what we don't know. Uh, and I think it's a dangerous extrapolation if we say, okay, their albumin is low, therefore we should replace it. Right? We don't have data to support. Well, in resuscitation, to, to Doug's comment, I think it's, that's an excellent point. Is, like you said, we, we don't know really the resuscitation component versus replacement component. Well, and I think, you know, this is where the, the Wayne State data was fascinating to me. You know, again, 40 year old data, but these are this, this idea of protein flux and the fact that they, you know, came in and say, you know, people in shock, their albumin goes down. We know that. I don't think we still quite understand why 
we don't, you know, the fact that I'm still doing push pull in the ICU on occasion um, means that I don't understand how this all works because that definitely doesn't work, but we still do it. And, and, and like, until we get around some of that stuff, it's clear that we have a long way to go to understanding how fluid and proteins move. And I, we don't know how we're messing with it by supplementing. You know, we, you know, I, I'm staying away from my other topic of bicarb here, but it's like you're fixing one number. Again, it's the same thing where it's like you're fixing one number and not realizing what downstream effects that may have. And so looking at that stuff, when you give the albumin and you drive down all the other proteins, well, your situation has not improved, um, but your albumin may be better. And it's, it's like, okay, so we have a long way to understand this and, and we're not there yet. I think another important, interesting point though, too, with, with albumin in terms of replacing albumin, like you were saying with the bicarb, albumin's an acid. I mean, when we look at at least the, the uh, electrolyte con uh, component to it, and yeah, you're, you give albumin, now you're just giving an acid, which to me, that part never kind of made sense of why would we make an acidemia worse or try to treat an acidemia by giving more acid? Well, <laughs> <laughs> just one more thing. I, I just don't understand. Yep. I don't see Adnan here. He'd, he'd be the one that would be arguing with me. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious if there are other opinions. I agree with you, Justin. Thanks for the thought. I, I do remember when Adnan graduated from his critical care fellowship, he said, I'm going to do a study on albumin and prove you wrong. I keep telling him about once every two years. I'm waiting. <laughs> well, so I guess, I guess my last question then, and, and to leave on, is why do we still use it then? And, and literally I have a pharmacist when a trauma is crawled into 212 and they bring multiple bottles of albumin, multiple vials of um, calcium and they bring in bicarb. And I'm like, why, why do we do that? And why do we still give it? Why even a couple of weeks ago, this is old data on a lot of this, why is albumin going through a Belmont? And you know, I, I guess I, my, my big question is, well, how do we get over this hurdle to say that this is not what we should be doing or we need to be doing something else? And I think it's going to have to be, I don't want to say dumbing it down, but doing these experiments to prove once again, that is definitely with all that we know, this is definitely not what we should be doing. Um, I think you can and, talk to the director of trauma anesthesia and make it so. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> But, I, but it's one of these where it's like, you know, I, I think looking at transfusion triggers, you know, people that still won't transfuse a trauma patient because their hemoglobin is 10. It's like, but you just watch four liters pour out of their chest. I'm pretty sure they're going to need the blood, regardless of what their hemoglobin comes back at. Um, or looking at different formulations, you know, plasma is hard to get. I think it may be the answer for a lot of things, but we need a better way to get it. And whether that's freeze dried, whether that's you know, something else besides something that needs to thaw for 45 minutes before we can get it. But maybe it's, it's looking at those answers of what we know the patient needs rather than looking at the band-aids. You know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of um, protocols of trauma, m more than actually a lot, but there are some places that have CPGs on everything and the military has these and they sit there and they're easy. And, and if you just give CPGs and say, this is the way we're doing it. And if we're not, we're going to do a study otherwise. I mean, it's, I was just talking to someone else that like, we do this, 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 then someone else comes into the institution and says, well, we did it this way. So we're going to start doing it that way. And, and not, and they may be right, but it shouldn't be just that person doing it with everyone else doing it that way. They got to bring that in. We should change our protocols if they're right and everything else. But what happens is people come in with their own expertise. They think they're right. They, they don't necessarily read all our protocols or understand the thought process behind them. And so I think we need to make sure that as people come in, that they, they understand that trauma is a system. They aren't one individual, but part of the group. And if they're going to deviate from it, there should be good reasons. So, um, you get what I'm saying is that, that we don't, we aren't able in the system as we have it to keep our individuals from practicing individually. We tend to let that happen more than at some places where things are a little more protocol. We like the military. Well, 
any last comments? Because we are over time, and I want to make sure we get out or uh, you know, end it on on relatively close on the time. Uh, congratulations, Justin. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm gonna go try not to get in trouble for being away for an hour now. All right, with that, thank you guys. Uh, next month, I think one of our surgery fellows is speaking, Jordan Kirsch, she has to give me a topic. So um, I will send that out shortly. Thank you guys. Thanks, Justin.